Hey, greetings, Fred in Alaska. Uh, thanks for joining me. Um, what I wanted to share with you guys today uh, happened at someone's remote property. What they did is they went on to Alaska lands and they found a five acre parcel way out in the middle of nowhere, a place where you have to be flown in in order to build there. So they got the they got the five acres they wanted. It was two brothers. Um, we'll call them Jim and Jake, right? Jim's the older brother, Jake's the younger brother. And uh, they're separated in age by about seven years. So they their plan was over the course of three, four, five years or so, and this sounds similar, I know, to a, 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 another uh, encounter. So anyway, they had their game plan out and they had planned on their dad joining them halfway through the building season, right? Because they were taking float plane trips with their material, which is crazy. This happened about 10 years ago. Um, the, the parcel of land is in the interior. Uh, it is south of Fairbanks. Uh, uh, he gave me the GPS coordinates, but I, I'm not sharing all that shit. So basically, south of Fairbanks, north of Wasilla, you know, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, Dave, I'll, I'll get to it. I'll, get, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, so they're taking these float plane trips back and forth, get, bringing materials there. Uh, they never stayed alone. They, they knew better than to be alone. So after they got about four or five of these trips and they had enough base material to, you know, start their project, uh, they, they came back with their supplies and stuff, were dropped off, had their plans made out to get picked up in a week um, for further supplies if needed, what have you. So as they're working, they're brothers. So there's immediately friction because they've been at this for like a week the stress of flying back and forth, right? So Jim Jim was explaining to me that he was trying to express to his younger brother, hey, I'm I'm over 40 now, and you, you know, you're still in your late 20s, calm down, we'll get this stuff done. Kind of trying to teach his younger brother, let's slow it down, or in his early 30s, I should say. So, you know, they finally found their pace, and they were they were building continuously because you know land of the midnight sun they were putting in the hours hardcore um, they freely admitted they were not paying attention to their surroundings uh, they were approached by a grizzly bear twice and it got within 20 feet of them not noticing them because they were being quiet at the moment or maybe it was drawn in by their noise and then however it worked out but they were crept on twice by a bear each time the bear immediately ran off they weren't in danger of the bear <laughs> so as they're sitting there discussing, okay, we need to be a little more proactive and keeping our asses fucking safe here because, you know, it dawned on them because they, they took it for granted. And so when it dawned on them that they were endangering themselves by constantly keeping their head down, they their work ethic changed at that moment because if one stopped and looked in the direction, the both stop and looked in that direction kind of thing so they were they're were a little hypersensitive and I, I get it you know if you're approached by even a 500 pound brown bear a grizzly bear it is very intimidating they're big it's on tv you can compartmentalize and tell that they're smaller you know you can kind of make them whatever size you want but when it's in front of you you know 25 feet away it's a different story believe me um so this keeps going on for about three days after the second bear encroachment. So they're about a week in the building. The plane is due that day. So the plane makes it in and they're having a discussion with the pilot and the pilot says, hey, I, ha I still have extra stuff in there. I can only take one of you. Is one of you willing to wait here? It's a three, four hour round trip. Everything's already staged. I just have to get you back there. We you can help me load it. I'll drop off the excess shit. We'll come back younger brother says I'll stay Jim says okay here you know you got the gun you got everything lay low stay by camp don't wander off we'll be right back so they take off they fly out you know do a little wing wave as they fly over the camp and so as they're and this is about uh, 150 yards away from a lake 
they don't own that part of the property but it's a lake big enough for that plane to land on right so and and that was one of their stipulations when looking for land that has to be a lake nearby to land at big enough for a little you know uh, float plane so the younger brother's sitting there I think I call him Jim and James so James is sitting there and he's got the rifle across his lap seven millimeter mag uh, and he's just kind of surveying the area just picturing what it's gonna be like right and as he's looking out over the tundra and into some of those uh, black spruce across a little bit of some muskeg because they were right at the edge of a tree line where the ground was firm and stuff and then you know not too far from there it gets into that tundra type stuff that I showed you when I uh, my still remote video so it, it's similar to that he's looking at a similar span of, of area up into a tree line and as he's surveying he you know, you'd stand up periodically on the floor they had built and look around do a 360 keeping you know want to keep track of stuff so he he's about two hours into his wait when he hears splashing down at that lake 150 yards away hold on one second here sorry about that uh, incoming call it was actually uh, Jim so <coughs> I'm just making sure I wasn't using their real names anyway so James here splashing at that pond that they land at right forgive the wind I hope it's not affecting the sound if it is eh, I don't know what to tell you um, so he hears the splashing and he he takes off down the trail with the gun and he's thinking oh that one of those bears we saw is probably bathing maybe I can get a, a picture of it so he brings his little camera and the gun and walks 150 yards now this trail literally uh, is right next to the tree line so you got the cabin and nothing but tree line on one side opens up the muskeg across a ways to another tree line so he's walking that same tree line the cabin side is on now the cabin's about 40 feet from that tree line so as he's on the trail getting following up to the tree line to where it continues on to the pond he catches an odor of something and he goes he thinks oh man that bear stinks that bear stinks like death uh, and he starts having second thoughts the the smell that he caught was really it was affecting him in in a very primal way because he said each step he was taking it it felt like he something within him wanted to go the other way and, and he didn't know why but young you know younger not a kid but brazen enough to continue on so he continues on and he reaches a point where and he's got his camera little camera hanging a little digital one hanging around a little line near around his neck right with a little clip off it popped off real easy so he's got it on there and as he's walking he catches that whiff of that smell again and something within him just kind of jolts and when he jolts he pop that little digital camera off of his lanyard and so he takes a step back and he sees it on the tundra and the trail and he kind of leans down uses his rifle reaches down picks up the digital camera leans the rifle against his hip kind of thing and is clicking it back on and one of the little little pieces that clicked together was broken so it wouldn't so he stuck it in his pocket zipped it up picks up the rifle and continues on towards the pond and as he's getting closer he hears some huge splashing because the wind changed the wind came hit him from behind and blew the direction of the lake and he was still about uh, 40 yards before he'd be able to see anything in the little landing area that they had made because um, on the first trip they brought a weed whacker and, and weed whacked a whole staging area for their stuff and then you know he was coming into that area and he heard loud splashing again and he noticed trees moving as he came into the clearing off to his right hand side so immediately he's got that rifle up and he hears a whoop the whoop he hears though isn't from in front of him it's across the lake the farthest distance where from where he was at across the lake he hears a whoop come from that direction so immediately his you know anyone naturally would want to look the direction of the whoop now uh, man I, I've been in situations similar so I understand the whole getting creep so 
he looks back, sees nothing, and as he looks back, as soon as his head, his eyesight is not facing the trees where this thing moved in, there's a loud crashing and thrashing off into the trees. He didn't see anything, right? So immediately he's on edge, he's got the gun, he's trying, I mean, he's spinning around in a 360, he's like, what the, and, and heads back towards the cabin. Uh, he's still got a good hour and some odd, maybe even longer if weather changed before anyone comes. So he's really not feeling being there in the moment. Heads back, he makes it to the camp, no problem. It's dead quiet at this point, and he's sitting up on top of the floor they built, and they had two of the walls up. So now, where the two walls are up, there's two huge openings for windows. So he can easily look out this side or that side and has the other two sides just nothing on it and they have a bunch of their tools piled up on there so he's kind of walking around in between the tools and you know everything that's laid out and all that kind of stuff just pacing and nervous so he decides you know what i, I don't want to be so close to the trees i'm going to take a lunch and some stuff and go sit out in the center of the muskeg over here out in the tundra and just just sit down on the you know in the berry patch and just chill and have a clear view of everything around me and I don't I don't blame him instead of being close to the trees where weird shit's happening <laughs> so he gets over there and he's sitting down and he's just looking back at the cabin just kind of eating a snack and and checking out every you know just every little movement sound anything but it was dead quiet but any the slightest bit of any kind of sound he was honed in on it focused hyper focused and so after about 40 minutes of doing that he starts hearing thrashing coming but sounding like it was just on the other side of that cabin structure where he couldn't see it and so because it should be close enough for the pilot and his brother returning with the rest of the supplies he's a little more confident in checking it out um, taking his time to check it out but checking it out nonetheless so as as James goes forward he gets up to the cabin and the window height is just a little taller than what he can see over so he grabs a hand and he pulls himself and, and is looking into the structure that's half built to see the other side right but staying concealed trying to creep up on it so he's got his arm he's looking up over the sill and as he looks, he sees movement in the trees. So he drops down, he's, he's sitting there pondering, well, ah, I couldn't make that out. And so he's, he's digging around, he gets his digital camera out, he makes sure it's turned on, and he goes around the cabin. He's got the rifle in one hand and the digital camera ready in the other. So as he comes around and looks in the direction, about 100 feet in front of him, in between two trees, he sees this silhouetted figure. He has the camera in his hand, and, and he told me himself he never felt so stupid. But the the realization he was looking at a living being standing up on two feet, looking back at him, uh, he he was mesmerized. He he was he wasn't stuck mentally, but he was taking it in. And just a second before he ready for that picture, right? It didn't happen. He didn't get the picture. Uh, he dropped the camera and the gun in shock. It, it wasn't like he was a sissy, N trust me. Um, talk to both these guys, that they're, they're, not, they're not wallflowers. They're, they're just not. They're, they're not a timid type. They're, they're guys, real guys like me. So immediately he, he realizes what happens. Shit, picks the rifle back up when he does, that figure is gone, right? From where he assumed that first whoop came from, he hears two more in rapid succession. Whoop, whoop. And here's what was just in front of him, out of sight now, take off in that, in that general direction. So he goes, ah, picks up the camera and starts running down the trail because he, he wants to cut it off at the pass and, and get a picture of whatever it is as it's running out of the trees, right? So he's running along, he's got the camera, He's doing his thing, and as he's approaching that clearing that they had weed whacked, um, he hears another whoop from that direction. So he looks, and when he looks, he sees a figure across that little lake. And as soon as he makes 
or puts eyes on it, it immediately takes off running out of sight into the trees. Now, this thing was a distance away, you know, uh, three, 400 yards. And this thing, he said it moved so quickly, whoop, it was gone. And he was distracted by that. And all he heard from the one that was on his right hand side, the one he was trying to get a picture of, was crashing into the trees, continuing along the tree line. It did not break out in front of him at all. So he continued down and there's a little bit of a, a game trail that kind of wraps around this pond. So he passes his little cutout spot and is running along this little game trail. And if anyone up here in Alaska has been on them, they're, they're narrow, you know, they're about, uh, they vary, but typically around a small pond like that, they're, they're relatively narrow. They're not like easy walking. You got the tundra mounds and all that kind of stuff, right? So he's navigating this still rifle in one hand, digital camera at the ready he gets up to a point where where the lake is bending and the game trail continues on into the trees so he figures i'm gonna go a few paces beyond that but i'm gonna stay in the open and i'm gonna hunker down and get this picture well he gets in a perfect position and this thing steps out and is looking right at him as it walks in front of him into a different set of smaller trees and cuts through to the direction the one was going he was hitting his button on that digital camera several times as this was going on. But he was so mesmerized at what was going on, he didn't realize he didn't turn the camera back on. When everything went down and he initially turned it on and it dropped, he turned it off as he was picking it up. And then everything transpired from there. So the whole time he's, he, he said he hit the button repetitively, you know, a, a couple dozen times just trying to get a frame by frame of this thing moving in front of him about maybe 25, 30 feet in front of him. All that energy and effort, sorry James, I, I know that's not your real name bro, but I apologize, I don't mean to laugh, but that's, that's how it ends up going, man, that sucks. So he immediately recognizes because there's nothing showing on his little screen, right? And he, he's immediately like, well shit, no one's gonna believe me. So he starts hauling ass back to the cabin. He doesn't want to be in that area because now he knows he visually, he heard, but now he had seen it run off in a direction and this one was going that general direction. So he hightails it the opposite direction back to the cabin. Now, when he gets back to the cabin, everything that was up on that floor was scattered like a tornado hit. Now, the only thing he could think of is as he was running along to catch up as it was crossing in front of him to get those picks, this thing backtracked on him and flung all their shit everywhere, right? So he gets back and he's like, what the, what the fuck? You know, all my, all our stuff, you know, all their hand saws, all their, you know, they, they would recharge their battery packs at the pilot's hangar that they were getting a ride from. So every time they would flop out, uh, uh, they had, uh, 80 different DeWalt batteries for their for their cordless tools that they were using so they they were they thought it out but you know anyway all their shit was scattered about all the batteries uh every every little impact and all that shit saws all, all that just gone scattered all about and it it he said it looked like a literal tornado hit and just randomly poof, scattered everything everywhere like a shotgun blast it, it was in a big radius all around the cabin except for the side with the two walls up with the missing windows on that side it was just uh whatever would make it out the window the direction of the window right so this thing jumped up there speculative but i mean it was the only other creature around to do it and flung all the shit so now he's very pissed off for one and wants to shoot one of them uh and begrudgingly, he's walking around carrying this heavy ass seven millimeter. It was like a Mauser. So those old school World War II joint, those fuckers are heavy. You know, 11, 12 pounds doesn't sound like much until you've been packing it for a couple hours. So he's going around and he's picking up what he can and carrying it back, staying armed the whole time. And as he's doing this, his brother, Jim and the pilot fly over and circle around once or twice and then wave the wings and head back towards the pond for the land because they were coming down to make the landing. So he immediately drops what he's doing, takes the rifle and, and runs that direction to, to meet up with them and warn them. 
Now, when they came in landing, they came in, the, he, uh, the pilot had to slip. And what that means is, is he's coming in too fast, he has to slow down, so he'll turn the plane sideways. It, it's, it's a rush if you're ever in one. Anyone who's dealt with it knows exactly what I mean. The whole plane just turn to the side to slow your airspeed and then drop on down on the lake. So that's what the pilot did. And uh, once he did that and landed and they got over to shore, James with the rifle had been hearing what sounded like braking going on in the general direction of where he was knelt down trying to get those pictures. Uh, just right, right in front of him, the direction he was looking. And he said it had to have been 60 yards away that he was hearing this noise. It's, he said it sounded like someone just continuously breaking, you know, a stick. Just, just constantly like that, right? So he's focused on that, but there's, there's engine noise coming from the pond. So that all kind of hums out, but he's still watching. And as he's watching, he notices movement go back that direction back the direction it had come from when he was trying to get the picture so he's immediately reaching in his pocket again and by this point he's trying to get out his digital camera to turn it on this time make sure it's fully on <clears throat> just as uh, the pilot kills the engine he starts he's he sets the rifle down because they're close enough and he's yelling hey hurry 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 i'm gonna go get these pictures come on go, get grab the rifle come on let's get these pictures Jim is getting out and he's on the float and he's got one of the ties for the pontoon and he's he's got one hand up on the wing saying what the hell are you talking about and he said and, and Jim's immediately like why in the fuck are all the tools spread around the damn cabin dude what the hell have you been doing just practicing your 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 pitching arm or what and he's like dude grab the fucking rifle bro and follow me this thing is over in the woods immediately the pilot said no 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 you're not going anywhere near those fucking woods. What did you see? So he breaks down everything I just relayed to you guys. And the pilot, uh, originally from Iliamna, said, get your shit and let's get out of here for a little while. I'll bring you back in a week or two, but let's clear out. Jim immediately is like, look dude, what the hell, why would we want to leave and and have to come back to, to start again. So he goes, did you hear what your brother said? And he goes, yeah, he saw something. And he goes, no, no, that's the hairy man. There was more than one and they flung your stuff. He was trying to relay to him, something's going on. You don't want to be in this area right now. Come back, give it a week, give it a week. And grant you it's a short season and they weren't too happy about it, but they listened to what he had to say. I, I can't relay it, but um, they, they listened to him, they heeded his words, so they packed up everything they could, um, all their batteries, all their tools and stuff, the important, you know, valuable stuff, and stored the rest underneath their floor, flew out. Um, they didn't end up making it back to that piece of property for two years. So, originally this happened ten years ago, so eight years ago, they finally made it back. When they made it back, nothing appeared to be touched. Porcupine chewed on some of the plastic stuff, but it, it was dead quiet, no, no sound, no nothing. Um, they finished building the place. However, across the lake, where that, that initial whoop came from that got his attention, when they had been flying in on, you know, a two, you know, two seasons later to continue building, they noticed there was things that looked like a structure so out of curiosity they eventually went over there and it had long been you know uh kind of quasi torn apart but it looked like a he said it looked like what he would envision a big bird's nest looking like on the ground uh he said it was lined with uh pieces of rabbit fur um pieces of unidentifiable fur caribou um some some pieces of moose uh pelt and it, he said it was it was comfortable he actually got down in it and laid in it and uh, he was looking for the pictures I hope he finds them of him laying in this nest basically uh, where it was at and they go back about every two to three years to this cabin um, mainly moose season they'll fly in for a week good moose area whatnot um, but the last time they went out to this cabin the part of the roof line 
was depressed. So the edge was, it looked like the edge was pushed up and kind of crinkled it in the middle. And they don't know how that happened. Um, that there's no, nothing around, no, no broken tree to, to show how that damage happened, but it, it, he said it either looked like something big was standing on the top and it gave way or something big pushed up the eave because it kind of crumpled in like a dimple and had the, the edge line of the roof kind of uh, pushed up. And uh, they have not fixed that yet. Um, they were looking through their stuff to send me pictures of this stuff, so I hope they get it soon. Um, if they get it in time, I'll have it on this video. If not, when they do get it to me, I'll have Dave posted on the website. Um, let's see. Uh, my, my personal hand drawing I, I gave to Dave to put on the website earlier today. Um, it's, it's the original artwork I used for some of my, um, my thumbnail picks. It's the original pencil drawing I did of what I saw looking at me in the window. Um, so that's under the new, my New Yakuk Nightmare uh, video on the website, subarticalaskasasquatch.com. And uh, let's see, shout out to Dave the Tech Guy. Uh, me and him have a powwow this weekend as far as uh, fundraising merchandise. That'll be coming soon. What else? Uh, shout out to all the new subscribers. Hey, thanks for joining us here. Uh, let's see. I, I'm going out on an excursion. Coming. Let's see. I, oh, spaced out radio tomorrow. Sorry. Uh, tomorrow night, spaced out radio. Dang it. I almost forgot. Sorry, Jessica. I was about to leave town on you. <laughs> I'm glad I caught myself. I got some calls to make this squat, uh, scratch some stuff for this weekend. Anyway, Spaced Out Radio tomorrow. Uh, check out uh, Jessica's Facebook, Jessica Jones. Uh, she has the times. It's 6 o'clock Alaska time, so I think it's 10 o'clock Eastern time. I, something like that. I, I'm horrible with that shit. Forgive me. Uh, no disrespect, Jessica. Um, let's see, yeah, uh, watercolor for donations, uh, Miss Lynn hit her up, they always got some kind of fundraising, she does excellent work, um, and, uh, shout out to Miguel, Sasquatch Theory, DA Roberts, man, my buddy, Anthony, I haven't heard back from you, um, let's see, and, uh, until the next one, we'll talk to you guys then.